welcome to Money Matters. My name is Patty Tuadros and I'm from Zercel. My co-host tonight is Charlie Shields from Wells Fargo Advisors and our special guest is Matt Bloom from Crime Watch Technologies. So it's great Patty, having you here. You? Yeah, good. So I know we're gonna talk a little bit about energy prices dropping. So can you tell us what's going on with that? Sure, I wanna remind our viewers and listeners not to time their decisions based on what I say today. And also we're not lawyers, we're not accountants, so uh, people should talk to those kind of people for those kind of issues. So energy prices, uh, and not trying to time the show to the day or anything like that, we've had a 30, 35% drop from top to bottom in energy. So the question is, are we going into a recession? Is it gonna get a lot worse? Or are we gonna stabilize here and go back up? My feeling we're probably gonna stabilize and energy prices will start to work their way back up but there'll be a lot of cues if I'm wrong. If airline prices keep going up, I mean, if airline stocks keep going up, that's a sign that maybe oil's going lower. If airline prices stabilize and start down, that will be a pretty good cue that energy prices are gonna stay steady or work their way back up. You know, from a consumer standpoint, it's great when energy prices are low. It is, to, uh, to a certain extent. If we do go into a recession, then there's other problems that kick in. But right now, the fact that energy had a short, sharp drop doesn't say that we're going to have a recession. Yeah. So do you see a lot of people investing in the U.S. as opposed to other places in the world? Yes, and that's been a tendency for quite a while, and now everyone's starting to talk about it. And I always wonder whether it's uh, about to stop when everyone's talking about it. So right now, price-to-earnings ratios in the U.S., uh, forward PEs are something like 16 or 17 times earnings and you can buy stocks a lot cheaper in other places in the world. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the other places are the right place to invest right now, but it's something to keep an eye on. How long do you think it could last? Well, I think the, uh, the markets could continue to go up for a long, long time if interest rates stay low, if uh, corporations continue to spend their cash wisely, and that might mean you'll have to pick out certain stocks as opposed to other stocks because when price to earnings ratios get up this high, uh, it's getting to the point where you have to be more selective. But I think there could be a lot left in this market. Yeah. So do you see the U.S. economy on the mend? I do. The last few GDP uh, numbers have been improving since the first quarter. We're now, the last couple of quarters, up near 4%. Uh, I believe that can continue. There's a pent-up demand for laborers, and I think that uh, after five years into a recovery since 2009, where things are starting to go well, uh, we may start to see some increases in housing prices and, and values. We may start to see some shovel-ready pro projects actually start to do things, and that could be huge. When those big macro things start to happen in a positive way, it feeds right through the rest of the economy. I would love it if my, uh, my condo value increased. <laughs> sure, well, you're enjoying living in it, and yeah. if it increases in price, that's a good thing also. Yeah, so how about the Fed and the interest rate? Do you think they're gonna raise it? Well, they're gonna have to, and the question is when. Uh, the, uh, presumptive time that they were going to raise rates was toward the end of 2015 or at the start of 2016. And now I'm starting to hear some Fed speakers say it may be in the middle, middle of 2015. And there'll probably be some kind of a market reaction initially when they hear that rates are going up because the punch bowl has been on the table with low interest rates for a long time. And people will start to be afraid that they're going to take the punch ball off the table, but I have a feeling after a knee-jerk drop in the market mm -hmm. when they start to raise rates, the markets will start to go back up because there's nothing wrong with having a 1.5% or 2% money market rate mm -hmm. and a 4% 10-year bond and a 5% 30-year bond in a normal economy. So the fact that rates are going to start to go up sometime in the next 6 months to 18 months is not necessarily a bad thing. How does it impact consumers who are looking for mortgages? You said that you think home prices are going to go up. Is that going to stagnate people purchasing homes? Well, people got spoiled. Uh, we, we got a, if you go back to my grandparents' time, 5% uh, mortgages uh, were not unusual. 
and then mortgage rates went way up to double digits, and then they came back down. And then they went under 5% again a few years ago when the economy got pretty soft. And now people think that they have to wait for a 35 or 4% mortgage. Mm -hmm. But I think as prices start to go and people are tired of waiting to buy, as they see that they better hurry to get a rate under 5%, I think there'll be a rush to get mortgages. That'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. So what else can we look forward to with commodity prices? Well, commodities tell you a story. If gold prices are going down, that's one element to say that inflation is not a problem. If the 30-year bond is staying low, that's another clue that inflation's not a problem. So you look at commodities to tell you a story. Grain prices are very low. Mm -hmm. Gold is low. It was at 1900. It's come down to the 1200 area. So that says don't worry about inflation. If we start to see those things reverse, if long-term interest rates go up, if gold prices start going back up, then that's a clue to watch out for inflation, and that's a time to think about purchasing commodities. And there's no bell that rings. And so somebody that doesn't have any commodities might start thinking about putting a little bit of money in now, and then uh, every six months put a little bit more, because commodities will get their time in the sun eventually. Do you have a favorite commodity that you like to recommend? Well, gold is the one I look for to indicate, uh, but right now the grains are very cheap. I'm not an expert on commodities, but Talk to your financial advisor, get advice, but yeah. I would be looking at the grains right now because they're pretty cheap. That's good to know. So what about overseas equities? Are they out of favor? They are out of favor right now. They're cheap relative to the U.S. People in Europe, people in China are investing money in the U.S. right now because we're the safest place, or another way to say it is we're the cleanest dirty shirt right now in the world economies. But at some point, that's going to shift, and when it does, there'll be rapid movements overseas. Again, I would be, be looking to make sure you're properly allocated with your assets, and I would be making sure you have some money overseas now. So how does that tie in with what you said earlier was that the U.S. seems to be the place people are investing, but down the road, people are going to flip and they're going to start investing overseas? Well, trends change, and sometimes they can change suddenly. The conventional wisdom for quite a while has been to put your money in the U.S. And when it becomes so obvious to everyone that that's the thing to do, it's dangerous. So be careful out there and start thinking about shifting some money to other places other than the U.S. right now. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, let me ask you a few questions, I okay? I would love to. Tell me about your company. So my main company is Zersal. We build websites, we create brands for companies, manage their social media and create everything they need to market their organization. But recently I launched another division called Smoochie Paper, and we do all the fun stuff that people look forward to in their lives when they're getting married, if they're Jewish and their kids are having a bar or bat mitzvah. Okay. We do invitations for it. And it's is that a subsidiary fun. of your original company? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, tell me about uh, how, how things are going. Are earnings flat, going sideways? Are you? Is, are things improving? What's the economy telling you about uh, your, co your company and how you're going to do in the future? Yeah, so things actually are improving. People are starting to loosen up their purse strings. They want to spend the money in their budget. They're not holding on to it. So they're trying to unload it right now, and they're planning for next year, which is great. And then in the other division, in Smoochie Paper, it's good because that's never flat. Everybody's always excited to spend money on invitations for big parties. Okay. Well, if somebody wanted to do a bar mitzvah or something like that, how do they get in touch with you? What, uh, do you they have a go website? Go to smoochiepaper.com. Okay. Yeah. Good. So I believe it's time for a viewer question. All right. Okay. This one comes from Norman Walters in Marion. He asks, what sectors of the market do you see as safe investments for the future? Okay, uh, people should be properly allocated, and so if someone right now had already had most of their investments at work, then uh, I would say just stay allocated the way you're supposed to. Every six months, look and see, see if some sector has been outperforming, mm -hmm. and therefore maybe you should trim some money from that. A sector that's been underperforming, like energy lately, mm -hmm. you should be adding to that. And some people like to do a snapshot every six months. Some people like to do it once a year. If someone came to me with new money right now, I'd say let's buy a full position in energy at this point. Let's not buy a full position in biotech 
because biotech stocks are way up and they're a little bit dangerous for a correction. Okay. And then you slowly work your way into be properly allocating, and that's the way to do it. Okay, great. And if you viewers out there have a question, here's how to send your question to Money Matters. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. So now for our special guest, Matt Bloom. You're the CEO of Crime Watch Technologies. So what is Crime Watch Technologies? Oh, thanks for having me today. So mm -hmm. the Crime Watch Technologies, we developed a technology called the Crime Watch Network. And it's a, it's a national information sharing and intelligence gathering network specifically built for police. Um, the way I describe it is it's a, it's a public engagement platform. It uses the web and social media and mobile technologies to let police organize all the crime information that happens in their local jurisdictions in a way that it can be effectively targeted into local communities. So for example, if, if the police department uh, where you live was using our technology and somebody in your neighborhood was arrested for a crime, you would get that notification on your phone. If you saw sirens down the street and you were curious about what was happening, you could look at the Crime Watch mobile application and know, oh, they're responding to X, Y, Z. So our technology takes that overwhelming amount of data that law enforcement create and operationalize it in a way that it can be effectively distributed into the community. Now, is it real time? It's not always real time. We're working on part of our product as it becomes fully realized, we'll have that real time application. But as it exists today, because uh, there's so much information that we're organizing and it has to be selectively targeted, uh, right now it's done through a manual intervention. So the police department chooses what they want to distribute when and where, and as a result, it's not necessarily real time right now. Okay. Well, give us some more specific examples of some of the information that could be provided to a mom or a dad that's out there listening. And okay, so a lot, of, a lot of people are familiar with uh, the the sex offender sites, the Megan's Law website. Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania State Police have a legislative requirement to make that information publicly available. It's there, it's a resource, and if people are interested in that information, they can go and seek it out and they look this information up. We take a different approach. We become proactive with the distribu distribution of information. And we focus on detailed information that goes beyond sex offenders. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, in the state of Pennsylvania and nationally, and really it's a global problem, there's many times where somebody's arrested for a crime, they're seen before a judge, maybe they receive bail, or they're released on their own recognizance, and they're back out in the community. Mm -hmm. And there's this big breakdown in communications. If the local newspaper doesn't cover that person's arrest for whatever reason, uh, maybe it's not sensational enough, maybe it's not a big enough news story, maybe it's a rural community and it, it, there's no media coverage in that community. There's a breakdown in people having to live with people that have been accused of crimes and there's no way for them to stay informed. So our technology completely breaks that down and we distribute this information directly from the police department, directly to the public, and it's highly detailed information. So uh, if somebody's arrested for a crime, when you get the notification on your phone or through the mobile application, it's their mugshot, it's the details around their arrest, all within the leg legislative requirement of public record, and it's all part of a public incident, so we don't cross any boundaries with what we release, but we essentially do what the local newspapers did, but on a really local So level. you're just d putting out facts, you don't have to worry about legal issues, you're just saying what's actually happened. Correct, it's part of a public incident, so okay. at this stage of the game, and we have controls so that if somebody is distributed on the system because they were involved in arrest, and later uh, they're exonerated of their charge or the charges that are dismissed or they serve their time even, we, ha we have controls in the system that they can easily be removed and redacted from the internet. And uh, that's a powerful system that doesn't exist currently. So. so I think I follow how you're different from regular media, but are there other details besides the fact that it's not emotional? Well, so there's a couple aspects to that. So uh, when we talk about technology, we all know that people today tend to put more value in updating their Facebook status or looking at their Twitter feeds and, and attending to their virtual world 
they put more value in those virtual communities than they do in their own physical communities. And for law enforcement agencies who are charged with the, ta the task of community policing, that presents a problem. How do they engage the public in these digital platforms? Well, traditionally speaking, they would rely on the newspapers, the radio, the television to get information out to the public. But if you're familiar with the changes in the media landscape, our local newspapers and our local TV stations are now covering huge geographies. Mm -hmm. And so they have to look for what are the most interesting stories from all throughout this seven, eight, 10 county region that are gonna sell me or build me local audience so that I can sell advertising. Well, that presents a, a fundamental problem for local police departments. So we enable the police departments through the websites and the portals and our software mm -hmm. uh, to distribute that localized news directly to the public. So that's differentiation number one. Two, we do it in a way that when law enforcement shares that information, they have the ability to edit and delete it after the fact. So if a piece of information is distributed to Facebook today, it's on Facebook servers. And if that piece of information is shared thousands of times, it's on a thousand different servers and there's no way to control that information. With the Crime Watch technology, when it gets posted onto the Crime Watch system, it'll automatically distribute to Facebook and Twitter and some of these also other social sites. But we, we can retain the hosting of that information. So if they find out two weeks from now, they need to edit or delete that posting, they go back into our Crime Watch technology and it will go out, and update or delete every time it's been shared. So that's a different too. We have a story, we retain control of that story, and that way if the story needs to be updated or deleted, we can do that. I never so, imagine you could access, if I shared it with my friends and family, that you could go in and change my... Right, so our, our technology at the core is called a controlled content distribution network. Okay. And uh, the technology is built in a way that we have a chain of, chain of custody for all that content as it's distributed on the web. There's anomalies and there's, there's aspects of it where somebody could do a screen capture or print something out or maybe there's a caching layer on their web browser. Mm -hmm. So there's a possibility that the information can't be 100% controlled, but we, we have a level of control that's never existed in the past and it really mitigates liability for law enforcement agencies. Because they're sharing very detailed information. Yeah. I'm thinking that some, some states and some local communities would be more interested in the privacy aspects and some would be more interested in knowing information right away and then correcting an error later. Do you have any issues dealing across states or one local community wants one type of information, another community wants more privacy and, and less rapid information? This is powerful technology. It breaks down normal ge geographic and jurisdictional restrictions, meaning if somebody gets arrested in one county in Pennsylvania but they're from New Jersey, mm -hmm. people that are browsing the technology from New Jersey will see that their neighbor was arrested in Pennsylvania. Okay. So we really break those down. The difference is that there are federal regulations and federal requirements that say, hey, you need, you have an obligation, legislative obligation to make certain pieces of information publicly available to the public, whether that be through a police blotter or through direct communication with the public. That's a universal standard all across the country. There's variation state to state, but it's a, it's a national problem and uh, we're meeting uh, we're within the, the, the regulation requirements, but we're meeting that demand on a national level. So, a question I have for you is that I follow the Philadelphia Police Department on Twitter. Right. If they opt to use your system exclusively and no longer directly go onto Twitter and push out a message to the community, can they use your tool to then push you, that communication? You would, still, you would still follow with them, follow them on Twitter like mm -hmm. you do today. The difference is that behind the scenes is our technology. So, uh, what will happen is, if they had, let's say they had a, a fugitive from Philadelphia that they were looking for, when they put it out through their Crime Watch system, it will syndicate across social media like it normally does. Okay. But we also have the capability we, where we can send it, syndicate it across our entire crime network. So for example, uh, recently uh, there's Eric Frayne who was wanted by the Pennsylvania State Police after he ambushed a couple officers in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pennsylvania State Police, their Pennsylvania Crime Stoppers program, uses our technology. So as soon as they had the mugshot for Eric Frayn, as soon as they had the reward information, they distributed it through the Crime Watch Network. So the, so the posting hit their normal media subscribers, you know, 1,000, 1,500 media subscribers that they normally communicate with via fax and email. But then we also syndicated it across the Crime Watch Network, and with a short period of time, about 48 hours, we had it in front of 200,000 unique people, just because it's all the people across our entire network that connect. And of course, those 200,000 people immediately shared that information with their friends and family, and that quickly we get that story out. 
to a lot of people. Okay. Uh, the, my research indicates you've been in operation about a year and a half right now. So what's the progress? What's the future look like for your company? So uh, that I originally started Crime Watch as a printed publication back in 2009. I did that for a couple of years and I had great success. Our last issue, the, the magazine, Crime Watch magazine, was distributed in 1,800 retail locations all throughout Pennsylvania. Huh? But if you remember anything about 2008, 2009, yeah. Uh, funding and scaling a publication like that was going to be di very difficult. What was fortunate at the time, I started to see this idea of the technology platform. So I decided in 2011 to shut down the publication. I reorganized, pivoted, relaunched a new company as Crime Watch Technologies with a technology platform. So we went live with the full version in July of 2013 to 15 police departments. And that first year live, and this is up in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. the first year live, they generated over 5,000 original news stories, generated well over 500 tips. They had over 100 actionable hard arrests that came from tips coming from the network. And it included fugitives that were on the run for over five years that the marshals and Pennsylvania State Police couldn't find. So since we launched, we now have 24 customers. And before years in, I'll be a little bit over 50. So we're having some pretty exciting growth. In your most optimistic scenario, will you be in a lot of other states 10 years from now? Is this something you want to keep local, or are you going to grow nationally? Well, we're actually it's a global application. Uh, we're in uh, early stage talks with the military now about some of the global applications of our technology. Uh, we have interest coming from Maryland to launch a program in Maryland. We have interest in Florida right now. And uh, I'm actually out doing fundraising, actively fundraising, to help scale this company uh, and make it national. Well, how are you generating revenue from your platform? Okay. That's a good question. The Money yeah. Matters show. We didn't even get to that. <laughs> so uh, the technology is software as a service. So yeah. law enforcement agencies that want to subscribe, they pay a setup fee and a monthly subscription. The monthly subscription gives them uh, access to a bunch of tools that they're currently using, but they pay different third-party vendors to do. So we combine everything into one platform. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the idea for them to switch is, is pretty minimal because they're getting a lot of value. Um, as our product becomes fully realized, it opens up a whole other back end of tools and services that we're offering too that will increase. And again, we're gonna offer that as software as a service too. Do you find it hard to get them to move over from three or four different platforms to a single platform? Well, if you look at the dynamics of law enforcement, you know, they're the, the mentality of a law enforcement officer is somebody who sticks with a career for 30 plus years. Uh, they get a system that works and they wanna stick with that system that works. But there's a universal problem developing right now that times are changing. Uh, they know and understand that there's a need to connect with people in these digital spaces. Mm -hmm. They're turning to Facebook, they're turning to Twitter, and they're getting more actively involved. But if you're familiar with the uh, NYPD incident recently, social media has a way to get out of control with them. So what we do is we offer a comprehensive solution that not only addresses their public engagement aspects of what they do, we also have this whole information sharing backend that is really powerful for them. It breaks down all the data silos that they currently work within. And as a result, every single police department that we've gone into at this stage and shown it to has been like, wow, we want that. So. I, I know a lot of people enjoy watching these TV shows, cold case files and all that. Do you think that this could actually turn into a channel? I mean, there's so many channels available now that people would want to tune in and see what's going on in their neighborhood or that sort of thing, or is it just going to be that you'll have to send out active information about breaking news type of things. It's interesting that you asked that question, and I was not going to go into that on this program, but I like to ask questions. Uh, if you I, I like to answer. Up. <laughs> so I have three. Uh, my long-term vision is I have three disciplines for the company and the organization. One is education and awareness. That's really what I tried to focus on with the magazine, and this is pre-Sandusky. So we were educating the public about uh, communal living with sex offenders, issues facing law enforcement. Uh, the relationship between crime and social and some of these other aspects. So that's an important factor to me and I want to get back to that at some point. Uh, technology and innovation was the second discipline and, and that's what I've switched to uh, to focus on because you know with anything if you want to have an impact you have to have the revenue and resources to support it and so that's what we're doing now building the revenue and resources and of course uh, the last part was intervention and outreach and I could see possibly a television program going into that part. Okay. So tell me, as an end user, I want to follow along. Do I need to download an app, or do I just go with regular social media? Right. You can go. Uh, you can visit us at CrimeWatchUS.com. Mm -hmm. uh, the only state that we have active today, although it is a national technology, is CrimeWatchPA. So CrimeWatchPA.com, one word. And from there, you can navigate in and find your local community and see what's happening around you. Or we have a mobile app, which is available on Apple iOS devices. 
Uh, it's in beta right now. We're getting ready for a full release. And uh, if you just go to the Apple App Store and type in Crime Watch, one word, you can find that app there. That's for fantastic. people that are my age, tell us about beta testing and what that means. And you know, because a lot of people just barely know how to turn on their computer, and then once they figure out an application, they can use okay. it. So. so the tricky part, we release the mobile app with a limited release because once you release something on a mobile platform, it's available for everybody everywhere. And since we're operating only in a niche section or a, a section of Pennsylvania right now, we wanted to control how many people could access this mobile device because on our mobile app, we allow uh, people to submit tips, videos, photographs, whatever they want to push up to get direct to law enforcement, they can do from that mobile app. So we were trying to limit intelligence coming in from all over the world mm -hmm. in these early stages. So we released it in a beta in a controlled group just to see how people interacted with the technology and what kind of information came in. Now that we've had it out since June, uh, we have a good base point of, of how people are interacting with the technology and we're working on a full release now. So it will be available for all mobile devices. So okay. hopefully that answered your question. It does. Yeah. I, I'm curious how, how you prevent someone who doesn't like their neighbor from putting some false information and how do you screen out uh, things that aren't true and or, or make sure that what you are telling is actually the truth? You would be surprised at the, uh, the processes that go on behind the scenes with law enforcement who are naturally skeptical of every piece of information that comes in. So they have their own tools for measuring on, on whether something seems actionable or not. Now, if there's a question of credibility, they usually do a, a cursory investigation to find out. Um, but you would be surprised. A lot of the tips we do have coming in are neighbors saying, hey, you know what? There's 15 cars in and out of this apartment, day in, day out, different cars every single day, and I think they're dealing drugs, and here's a full listing of every license plate that comes in. That's huh? good information to have. It's incredible information. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to thank you for being yeah. a guest on the show, Thanks and remind me. us again, how can people get more information about your okay. Visit site? Visit www.crimewatchus.com, or go to the Apple iOS app store and uh, search for the word Crime Watch, one word. Great. So. Thank okay, you. and next week on Money Matters, our special guest will be Mark Mulholland from Matthew 25 Fund, and he's going to talk to you about money markets. Thank you so much for being with us today.